Father, we come before you, Lord, um, to pray and ask that you would open our hearts to you. Father, I pray that you would help us this morning to better understand why we're here. Why do we sit in these red chairs? Why do we come once a week, twice a week? Why do we stand and read your word? Why do we stand and sing songs to one another and to you? Or why do we not do any of those things even though we're physically here? Father, I pray that you would help us to better understand what it is that we're doing here, better understand who we're meant to be, better understand who you are in the midst of the world that's around us. Reveal the hard things in our hearts that need to be revealed, and yet at the same time surprise us with your mercy and your grace for us. You're always available for a relationship, and I pray, Lord, that you would help us to see and receive that and know that. In Jesus' name we pray. Um, so we are going to continue in our series that uh, we're calling um, Unexpected um, based off of the life of Elijah and sort of who he is and, and what he's done and um, the things that he goes through. And this is his most famous story, right? This is the most famous story concerning uh, Elijah. And just to give you a brief summary in terms of where we are, if you weren't here with us last Sunday, as we first studied the life of Elijah together, um, we discover that he's a nobody from nowhere, and Elijah specifically, his life is in the context of a particular king named Ahab. Ahab is the worst king in all of Israel. Uh, Ahab is lifted up as king, and as soon as he becomes a king, he marries a woman named Jezebel, and he basically takes the entire nation and starts to worship idols, uh, and start to worship a god named Baal. Um, Baal is the god of fertility, Uh, Baal is the god of the storm and of lightning, of thunder, of all of those things. And so Elijah comes to Ahab and confronts him and basically tells him, "Um, yeah, you think uh, Baal is a great god? Well, guess what? Uh, For the next couple of years, there's going to be no rain. There's going to be a drought in the land. And so what God does is he sucks up all of the moisture out of the air, and essentially it's very, very dry for a long-term drought. Um, And it says at the top of chapter 18, so grab your Bibles. We're going to be in chapter 18, and we're going to look at verse 1. It says, after many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, go show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. So God is now ready to open up the heavens. God is ready to rain um, down, literally rain on the earth. And God specifically wants to send Ahab to send a very particular message. And so Elijah goes. So verse 2, so Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. It says, now the famine was severe in Samaria. So basically the area that Ahab was living in, it was very, very severe there. And Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. And when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. So we're introduced to a new person, a new character named Obadiah. Obadiah was the servant of Ahab and he was the chief servant. And his job was to maintain the household of Ahab. And when Jezebel, his wife, decided that uh, all of the Israelite prophets, all of the prophets of Yahweh needed to be eliminated, Obadiah didn't think that was right. And so he takes a risk. He grabs all the people uh, that were following the Lord at the time, the prophets, and he basically hides them. So he took a hundred of them. He hid them in two camps of fifties in two separate caves. And he would steal from Ahab the king food and supplies and water and stuff. And he would give that over to the prophets that were hiding in these caves. So Obadiah was a faithful servant of the Lord, even though he was serving under a king who was very much not faithful. Verse five, and Ahab said to Obadiah, Go through the land to all the springs of water and to all the valleys. Perhaps we may find grass and save the horses and mules alive and not lose some of the animals. Okay, so this verse is very revealing. This verse tells you a lot about this guy named Ahab. So again, there's been a a drought in the land for three years. Um, Obviously, this means that the livestock aren't going to be as healthy. They're not going to be able to eat and drink as much. Um, There's a consistent sense of anxiety that's hanging over everyone's head. How long is the drought going to last? We're we're missing food. Uh, Our harvest is getting shorter and shorter. Um, We're missing, like people are essentially dying because of this famine. And so Ahab's concern should be the people because he's a king of people. 
Like the people of Israel are suffering because of Ahab's selfishness and not relenting. All Ahab has to do is repent of his sin and go and follow the Lord, but he doesn't do that. Uh, the people don't want to do that, and so they're kind of stuck in this situation. And what's really interesting is what does Ahab seem to care about? Does Ahab seem to care that there's no uh, water for the people? No, Ahab's concern is for the animals of his kingdom. In other words, his objects, his stuff, right? What makes Ahab a great king is that he has lots of things. And part of back then, the way you calculated your things was to look at your livestock, was to look at your animals, right? Imagine that Ahab had a lot of cars, right? That he was a modern king in the Middle East and there was a famine and people were dying. And all he cared about was making sure there was enough gasoline for his garage full of hundreds of cars, the idea is you'd be like, oh, it's clearly this is a bad person, right? Now, we know that already. That's been established. But it's very revealing in just terms of how bad is Ahab. He's bad enough that he doesn't even care about his people. He cares more about his stuff than his people. And so he wants to find a water source for all of his animals. So uh, verse 5, And Ahab said to Obadiah, uh, Go through the, the land to all the springs of the water and to all the valleys. Perhaps we may find grass and save the horses and mules alive and not lose some of the animals. So they divided the land between them to pass through it. Ahab went in one direction by himself, and Obadiah went in another direction by himself. Okay? So they don't even, Ahab doesn't even ask any, any other person for help. <laughs> Ahab's attitude in all of this so far, thus far, seems to be pretty simple. God has taken away uh, water, and so there's a famine in the land. People are suffering. I don't really care. All I care about is my stuff. Okay? And the way that I'm going to provide for my stuff is by relying on me, okay? So I'm going to find the solution. I'm the one that's going to be able to do this. So Ahab goes in one direction, look for water. Obadiah goes in another direction to look for water. And just off the bat, you need to see that there's a contrast between these two men. Um, the reason why this story is being told to us is not just because Elijah is going to meet Obadiah while he's looking for water, but it really is to show a contrast. What is Ahab's relationship with God? None, zilch, zero right? Ahab believes himself to be so important that he can find water for his own livestock, even when no one else in all the kingdom has water. I mean, this is really dumb, right? It doesn't make any sense. But again, Ahab is so confident in himself that he's willing to do this. Obadiah is just a servant. So he's just doing what Ahab says. But also Obadiah is disobeying Ahab by hiding prophets of the Lord. And then look at verse seven. And as Obadiah was on the way, behold, Elijah met him. And Obadiah recognized him and fell on his face and said, Is it you, my lord, Elijah? And he answered him, It is I. Go tell your lord, behold, Elijah is here. So Elijah finally shows up. People have been looking for him for three years. He shows up. Obadiah recognizes him. And Elijah tells Obadiah, Hey, go and tell Ahab the king that I'm here. Verse 9. And he said, so this is Obadiah responds, how have I sinned that you would give your servant to the hand of Ahab to kill me? As the Lord your God lives, there's no nation or kingdom where my Lord has not sent to seek you. And when they would say he's not here, he would take an oath of the kingdom or nation that they had not found you. And now you say, go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And as soon as I have gone from you, the spirit of the Lord will carry you. I know not where. And so when I come and tell Ahab that he cannot find you, he will kill me. Although your servant, although I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth, has it not been told by my has it not been told my Lord what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord, how I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water? And now you say, go tell the Lord, behold, Elijah is here and he will kill me. Which is, so like, what's this long rant about? Okay, so Elijah comes to Obadiah and basically says, go tell Ahab that I'm here. And Obadiah's like, what? How could you tell me to do that? If I do that, he's going to kill me. So here's what's been going on. What Obadiah explains to Elijah is the common theory about people's uh, thoughts about what was happening with Elijah. So here's the thing. Elijah comes from nowhere. He's a nobody. Before, three years before this, he faces Ahab and he says, you have disobeyed the Lord. You've chased after other gods, and now there's going to be no water in the land. There's going to be a drought. And then what chapter 17 tells us is that the Lord then told Elijah, run away, go east of the Jordan, and I want you to hide there. And for a couple of years, basically Elijah just hangs out there, and a raven comes and feeds him bread and meat in the morning and gives him dinner at night. And that's it. And that's what he does. And he just stays out there and he hangs out there. And last week we talked about how he spent his time praying, right? And then he's moved to another location and he stays there with a, a, a widower and her son. But the idea is that the people, though, thought that Elijah had been moving around, kind of like a fugitive and running around because Ahab was after him. Ahab has been looking for him night and day on the mountains, in the desert. He's been looking everywhere. 
And apparently what was happening was people would think that they saw Elijah and then they would send to the king and tell the ki- Ahab the king, Elijah is hanging out in this particular city. And then the king's men or the king himself would come and they would be like, oh, actually, no, Elijah's not here. And so that person who said Elijah was there would be killed. And this would happen over and over and over again. So there came out this sort of myth, this legend that Elijah would show up. And then as soon as you told King Ahab about it, when King Ahab got there, the spirit of the Lord would whisk Elijah away. And then Elijah would disappear. So that's what people thought was happening. So Obadiah is sitting there going like, uh, I'm not going to do that because lots of people have done that. And every single time someone said, uh, Elijah is here, Ahab would go and the spirit of the Lord would take you away. And then Ahab would get there and discover that you're not there. And then he would kill the person that said that Elijah was here. And I'm sure Elijah was like, okay, that's weird. That's totally not what's happening. Like, I was on the other side of the river, like just chilling, hanging out with the ravens. Um, but Obadiah is freaking out and he's like, I can't do that. Now, here's what's really interesting. Obadiah is also the person who's hiding out like prophets, right? So why does he seem to be so scared to finally face Ahab? And it's because this is how faith works. Faith, sometimes you're in places where you have a lot of faith and things are going really well and you believe in Jesus with everything you have and nothing can stop you. And then there's moments where all of a sudden you're afraid to even admit that you're a Christian or admit that you're having a conversation with somebody and they're like, so what do you do on Sundays? And you're like, um, I go to a place, right? And you're just like kind of afraid to talk about your faith and the fact that you go to church on Sunday. And that's real faith. That's sometimes what it looks like. And Obadiah here is exhibiting the same thing. He's not being inconsistent. I mean, to some degree he is, but really he's just exhibiting what real faith looks like sometimes. So he's brave and courageous in one sense where he's willing to hide the prophets of Israel. But at the same time, he's terrified of actually facing Ahab and telling him that Elijah is here. And how does Elijah respond? Look at verse 15. And Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, I will surely show myself to him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him and Ahab went to meet Elijah. And I love this. See, in verse 15, what Elijah does is he reminds Obadiah of who he is serving. He says, as the Lord of hosts lives. Another way to translate that is as the Lord, your helper lives. In other words, he's reminding Obadiah, hey, remember, the only way that you were able to hide those prophets is because God enabled you to do that. The only way you haven't been killed already for having hid the prophets of uh, the Lord is because God is protecting you. And so God will continue to protect you. God will continue to help you. He's there for you. And so that's actually what part of what it means to gather a church together. Because we're out there in the world with our faith, fighting a battle, hoping and praying and living with God. But At the same time, we do need this kind of encouragement because there are times in our life where our faith isn't as strong and we need to be encouraged. That's why uh, the, the church gathers every single week to remind ourselves of this. You need to be reminded every single week in your spirit and in your heart that the Lord is with you, that the Lord is your helper right? That God is for you. God wants to um, encourage you. God wants to strengthen you. You need to be reminded of that every single week if you're going to go out into the world and be living as a light to a dark world that's around us. You need this. And what you see between Elijah and Obadiah is two brothers of the faith encouraging and strengthening one another. And Elijah reminds Obadiah that the Lord is your helper. That's the value of being at church. It's why you can't do church alone. You can't just go on the internet, watch church alone online by yourself and say, I did my worship today. That's not how it works. We're meant to have more than that. We're meant to have brothers and sisters who strengthen us in the Lord, who strengthen us and help us to see and know and understand the faith that we need to have in order to serve God well. And so this happens. And then in verse 17, when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, is it you, you troubler of Israel? I love that question. And I imagine Ahab to be a skinny man with like a goatee and like a little mustache here. Like I just picture him in my head to be the skinny little like, um, you know, Jafar from Aladdin. Like I imagine him to look like that. And I imagine when he saw Elijah, Ahab was like, is it you, you troubler of Israel? I imagine him to have a voice like that. Um, and then Elijah says in verse 18, and he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have and your father's house because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now, therefore, send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel and the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. And I love how forthright 
Elijah is, how direct he is, how he just faces this guy and just basically tells him, I'm the troubler, you're joking, right? Like, you know that it's your fault that we're in this situation. You know that we're in this situation because you went and worshiped other gods. Now go and gather your prophets and meet me at Mount Carmel and just turns and walks away, right? How gangster is that, by the way? Like, that's so awesome, right? I imagine if he was holding a microphone, he just dropped his mic and he just walked away. And I was like, okay, right? So look at verse 20. So Ahab sent to all the prophets of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Verse 21. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. Now this is really the crux of the issue. This is at the center of the problem. The problem is, it's not so much that Ahab led the people astray and that was it. It's that the people themselves were stuck in between two gods. There was a sense in which they were still worshiping the Lord on one hand, but they were also worshiping the Baals on the other hand. Their hearts were divided in two. Elijah says, how long will you go on limping between two different opinions? Right? So limping literally means to right, not be able to walk correctly between two. There's no confidence. The people have no confidence as to who the real God is. And part of it is because their desires have got, gotten them in trouble right? They desire God in one sense, but they also desire these idols in another sense. In other words, the people have come to think of themselves as so important that they can choose God whenever they want, Yahweh God whenever they want to. They can choose the Baals whenever they want to, but in reality, what it's done is it's weakened their spirit, and they're just limping between these two opinions, between these two gods, between these two religions. And so Elijah gives them the main question, And this is really the question of the entire Bible is, who are you going to serve? Because everybody serves somebody. You're either going to serve Yahweh God and you're going to live according to his word or you're going to serve some other God, potentially yourself, right? This is a theme that's throughout all of scripture, right? We've studied idolatry before. We know what this is talking about. Um, What's really interesting is in the New Testament itself, there is a exhortation, an encouragement that actually sounds a lot like Elijah's question. Uh, the Apostle John, uh, he's the youngest apostle. Uh, he wrote the book, The Gospel of John. He also wrote 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. And at the end, Revelation, and at the end of 1 John, he says this. He says, these are the last two verses of the book. And he says, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true And we are in him who is true, in his son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. So at the end of 1 John, he's reminding the people that he's writing to that Jesus is the true God. And then he says at the very end to close off his book, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Right? And and, uh, John uses the phrase little children as a term of endearment. He says, like, beloved friends, please keep yourselves from idols. At the end of 1 John, he's reminding the people that their primary issue, right, in in being able to keep God at the center is not having other idols. And and the way that you kind of start to put God at the center is to realize that Jesus is the true God. And that's what Elijah is confronting the people with. Do you know who the true God actually is? Now, Uh, For those of us who aren't as familiar with what we're talking about when we talk about idolatry, okay, especially for you seventh graders, we're going to talk about idolatry a lot because what we believe fundamentally is that idolatry is the chief sin. At the bottom of everything you do wrong is there is an idolatrous heart that wants something else other than God, okay? So if you were at the lock-in this past weekend, you heard us define idolatry uh, in a very particular way. So this is that definition. So idolatry is when you treat something God made, so usually something that's good, as too important or more important than God. So in other words, at the bottom of sin, right, at the bottom of every sinful inclination you have is to take something that God made, is to take something in creation that God made that generally speaking is probably good and then distort it by making it so important that it becomes more important than God. And that's where all sin comes from, right? 
So for example, if you steal something, right, you probably have in mind something you want. So you want money. Money can be a good thing, right? It can be used for good things. It can be an object, an object that's beautiful, an object that is pretty, an object that is worth having a good thing again. And when you steal from that, you are disobeying the Lord and you are making that thing more important than God's good rule, right? And that's what we do in every single one of our sins. When you lie, right? You're even taking something that is communication. So speaking to somebody is communication. God created communication. That's good. But then when you're lying, you're taking good communication and you're distorting it, right? And what you're doing is you're making that lie, that story more important than the truth, which is what God wants us to say. And you're doing that as a distortion of the truth. And so again, what we do at the bottom of all of our sin is we are idolatrous. We are seeking to put something above what God has for us or what God has already given to us. And because this is at the very center of uh, our sin, this is the issue that's, again, throughout the entire scripture. Who are you going to follow? What are you going to follow? Now, just to be clear, okay, every single person in this room is an idolater. And I don't mean by idolater like you go down and you bow down before actual idols. But what I mean is there are things that we prioritize in front of God. There are things that we put in front of the Lord as priority. Some more obvious than others. But every single person in here, because we're sinners, we're, is- we're also idolaters. So this, is, this question that Elijah has for the people is a question that's really directed at us. And so there are, if I asked you to sit down and list out all the things in your life that are more important than God, if we're perfectly and totally honest, we can fill notebooks with stuff of things that we think is more important than God, of things that probably aren't that important, but we put above God all the time. If I asked you to sit down and write a notebook with your family about the things that your family puts in front of God, you could continue to write even more things. What about the things that your friends put in front of God? And you can write even more things. What about as a nation, the things that we put in front of God? And we can write even more things, right? Like this, this is not something that we can escape by saying, oh, I don't bow down before an idol. I'm not an idolater. But actually the biblical definition for idolatry is anything that you put in front of God. And I read something really interesting. Um, This was a poll that was taken earlier last week um, about Americans' attitudes towards certain values because idolatry isn't just a personal thing, but I think that as a culture, there are certain cultural idolatries that we have a tendency to pattern ourselves after. And I want to show this to you so that you're aware of what I'm talking about. So uh, NBC uh, and the Wall Street Journal did a post, uh, did a poll where they asked uh, different segments of the population, so really the younger generation and the older generation, So millennials and Generation Z, so again, anywhere between the ages of, uh, they define it as 18 to 38, so basically 1980 and and beyond, and then 1980 and before. And they basically asked, how important are these things? And you'll see a huge generational divide in the first three, right? So the first question they asked was, how important is patriotism? How important is it to be proud of the country that you live in? How important is it to value the country that you live in? And your generation, and actually I'm considered a millennial as well. I'm like the grandpa of the millennial generation. Um, So our generation, right, when polled, we're a little bit above 40% saying that it's very important for Americans to be patriotic. Whereas the older generation, look, it's, it's closer to 80%, right? What about a belief in God, right? So you have less than 30% of our generation saying that it's important to believe in God. Whereas you have about 65% of the older generation saying that it's important to believe in God. But look at this one, having children. It's almost the same as belief in God. It's floating around 30%. So this next generation believes that it's not that important to have children later on. Whereas in the older generation, it's closer to 55%. Now, just based on these three things, right? I want you to ask yourself a question. What happens 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 40 years from now? What does the nation look like? What do the people value in America if the next generation, which is the largest generation in America right now, believe that patriotism, belief in God, and having children are actually not that valuable at all? What happens to the next generation? You have a generation that doesn't believe in country, 
You have a generation that doesn't believe in God. You have a generation that doesn't believe in family. What happens to those people as they try to navigate life? And there's a question at the bottom that's really important because that one's totally directly related to the top three. It's self-fulfillment. So how important is it to be self-fulfilled? The next generation says, almost 80% say, oh, that's absolutely important. Whereas in older generations, less than 60% say, oh, that's that important. So what you see here is there's a flip-flop. The most important thing, the most important value that the next generation has is me. I'm the most important thing about whatever's going to be happening next. There is no sense of serving other people, serving God, serving family. And that's a generational trend. And it's interesting because it even flows down into things like hard work, which is fascinating to me. So somehow this next generation believes that they should live for themselves, but it should kind of be given to them because less and less people believe in the idea of hard work, which is fascinating. And that's, that's a whole other issue. So when you talk about and hear about the next generation feeling entitled, it's polls like this that prove that that's actually the way people think. And therefore, this is the way that they act. So what does, what does this particular thing have to do with idolatry? Well, if me is at the center of idolatry, if the thing that I want most is me, then I don't want to think about other people. I don't want to think about my neighbors. I don't want to think about God especially. And I definitely don't want to be saddled with kids because that's going to make my life inconvenient later on. What I need to think about most is me. Now, this isn't a part of this particular poll, but it's everywhere and you can do your own research on this. But if you task and ask the millennials and Generation Z, how many of you guys suffer with loneliness? It's anywhere from 40 to 70%, depending on the poll. Like, duh, it makes sense. I'm so focused on me, I can't even have relationships with other people. And the reason why I can't have relationships with other people is because I'm so focused on me, and so therefore I'm lonely. So what's the problem? The problem isn't other people. The problem is the idolatry that exists in my own heart. You have to understand that this is not something that just affects you. But if enough people have this viral idolatry that lives inside of them, then it begins to affect the nation and society and culture in ways that will blow your mind 50 years from now. But there's going to be sociologists who study this stuff and 50 years from now, they're going to look back and say, what happened? Right? Now, don't look at this poll and be like, oh man, Pastor Kevin really doesn't like the next generation. Remember, I'm, I'm, I'm in the same boat as you are, okay? It's because I'm only 25 years old. But I'm in the same boat as you, okay? But what I want you to see is actually the reason why they, they put these two generations versus, because you could split it up even more and you can see how these things work. It's because they're comparing parents to children. That's really what they're comparing. In other words, how did these kids come to have these ideas? Because of their parents. The parents have certain ideas, but did they take these ideas and imbibe it into their kids? Not really. Definitely, that's not what it seems like. It almost seems like the parents have enabled their kids to think this way. So it's really, it is a two-generation issue. It's a two-generation problem. Because what the older generation has done is they've made an idol out of their children. Whereas the next generation has made an idol out of themselves. And that's how you have these kinds of beliefs. So it's a problem. It's an issue. And it's not just an issue, again, here in modern times. This is an issue all throughout the Bible. Um, before this, before Elijah tells the people, choose now between God and Baals, Moses did the same thing with the people, right? When they went and worshiped the golden calf, Moses had to punish them, discipline them. And then he says in verse 26, he stood at the, uh, at the gate of the camp and said, who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And the sons of the Levites gathered around him, right? So this is something Moses had to do. He had to issue this challenge to the Israelites. Joshua does the same thing. When Joshua is about to die and he's about to hand off the leadership to the next generation, he says, now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and all faithfulness. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Every successive Israelite generation has had to deal with this question, and so do you and me. We have to ask ourselves, who am I going to serve? 
Am I going to serve the God of Israel? Am I going to serve Yahweh God? Am I going to serve Jesus? Or am I going to serve myself? Who am I going to serve? That's the question. That's the question that's here to the people. That's the question the Lord has for you. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul says the same thing. He says, if you're really a believer in Christ, something changes. Look at verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died, so Jesus died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. In other words, a true Christian, their allegiance belongs to Jesus. So much so that they are willing to no longer live for themselves, but to live for the sake of Jesus himself. That's the attitude and the heart of a true Christian. And so after Elijah gives this question of who will you follow, look at verse 21. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. No one spoke. No one said anything. And their silence points to something. They know. They know that they're idolaters. They know that they've done wrong. And so what happens? Look at verse 22. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men, 450 men. Let two bulls be given to us and let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. And you will call and you call upon the name of your God and I will call upon the name of the Lord and the God who answers by fire. He is God. And all the people answered, it is well spoken. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose for yourselves one bull and prepare it first for you are many and call upon the name of your God, but put no fire to it. And they took the bull that was given them and they prepared it and called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon saying oh Baal answer us but there was no voice no one answered and they limped around the altar that they had made so Elijah gives them the challenge and basically says we're going to have two bulls two altars you prepare it you can even go first right now that's a huge disadvantage because if Baal is real and Baal answers with fire then Elijah doesn't even get to go because that's the real God that's the terms but but Elijah knows there is no Baal Baal doesn't exist so you guys go first you can do all the stuff, you can have all the time you need. And so from morning until noon, so for let's just say 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., they prepare the bull and they are limping around the altar. And what's really interesting about the word limping is that in the Hebrew, it can actually be also translated as dancing. So they do this weird limp dance thing all around the altar, crying out to Baal, O Baal, answer us. And at the end of verse 26, it says, but there was no voice, no one answered. Which makes sense because, again, Baal is not a real God. So nothing happens. They do this for three hours. After three hours, verse 12, sorry, verse 27, and at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is musing, right? So maybe, maybe you guys got to shout louder because, after all, he is, you know, one of the many gods, right? So you got to tar- target it towards him so he knows. Maybe he's thinking. Maybe his mind is wandering and you need to cry out louder, Right? Verse 27, or, or he is relieving himself. He's, he's taking a dump right now, right? Or he is on a journey, or maybe he left. He's just not here right now. Or perhaps he's sleeping and must be awakened, right? So Elijah's a little clever now, and he's mocking them. Verse 28, and they cried aloud and cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation, but there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. The oblation, by the way, is just the evening sacrifice. So uh, God tells the Israelites to make morning and evening sacrifices, so the oblation is the evening sacrifice. So they went from 9 a.m. basically until about 6 p.m. And after uh, noon they started to actually physically cut themselves and they started bleeding everywhere. And just how gross is this, right? But here's the thing. This is what idols make us do. When you serve something that is not real, when you serve something that's not God, you will eventually hurt yourself to try to serve this idol well. And one of the examples I can give you guys is about fame and popularity. Because you live in a particular generation where everything is, digi- uh, everything is driven digitally, 
right? So there's a digital life you have, a digital profile you have on either Instagram, Facebook, whatever, okay? Snapchat, whatever social media of your choice. But the idea is the goal of social media, the way you win in social media is when you amass as many followers as you can and when you amass as many likes as you can for all of your posts. And it becomes something that you can obsess over and it becomes something that you can think about way too much. But what's really interesting, and this is something that I just read about, and this is more prevalent for people in the fashion industry, so this applies a little bit more to Instagram, but there are a lot of people on Instagram who become Insta-famous, meaning they have you know, a couple thousand followers or whatever, so that's famous enough that people they don't personally know are following them and, and liking their pictures and telling them how cute their outfits are and blah, 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 and all this stuff. And then there are people who are super famous and have like millions of followers, and those are like real influencers, and they're able able to control product. Some of them have their own design, like labels and all this kind of stuff. But it turns out that a lot of people who are within the, the fashion industry world, um, and you may do this too, just because this is a thing, and this is not a thing I knew about, but basically there are people who hate follow. And what a hate follow is, is when you see an influencer who you don't like, and you follow them just so you never wear what they wear, right? Just so you never style yourself after this person. And I just, I just was reading an article about this and I was just thinking to myself, what a waste of time, right? Like the fact that you would fill your newsfeed with people you don't like just so you could say, I don't like that, I don't like that, I don't like I'm like, what do you think that does to a person, right? What does that do to you when you follow people you hate? And every time you see their picture, you're filled with joy and happiness? No, you're mildly annoyed. But what happens when you follow 10 people that you hate and they post a lot? then your social media feed is filled with people you hate all the time. What did you just do to yourself? Like, it's such a weird thing. It doesn't make any sense to me. But there's people who do that. And then I think about the flip side too. Like, what if you're a celebrity and you have millions of followers and a bunch of your followers only follow you because they hate you? What an interesting relationship you have with your followers. Some of them are fans, but some of them are following you because they hate you. And the only thing they, and the only reason why they follow you is so they can post nasty things about you. I, I just wonder, like, does that, does that help us understand each other better? Does that help you be a better person? Does it help you, like, it's just, it's mind boggling to me that this is a thing and people do this and it's common. And a lot of us do it without even recognizing how wrong it is. Like just how unbiblical it is to actually live that way, to actively follow people just because you hate them. But that's what idolatry does. Idolatry twists us and makes us distortions of ourselves so that we hurt ourselves and harm ourselves so much that we don't even recognize who we are. That's the problem, right? And here's the thing, poll after poll after poll tells us that every single person who spends an hour on social media, and it doesn't matter what platform, it doesn't matter if it's Instagram, it doesn't matter if it's Twitter, it doesn't matter if it's Facebook, it doesn't matter if it's Snapchat. After an hour on one of these things, they will poll people. And this goes across every single age group group. It's not just young people, it's not just older people, it's every single age group. After an hour on social media, they'll be asked, do you feel better about yourself? And every single age group will say, no, I feel less better about myself. So why do we do it? Why do we do it? Why do we engage? Well, it's because everyone else is there or this is what everyone else does. But it is actively hurting us. It is actively killing us. It is actively harming our souls to be on social media as much as we are. Some of you guys have iPhones and on iPhones there's screen time and you can see how long you're on on certain things. If you deal with loneliness, depression, if you deal with issues where you like have very little value of yourself, open that app and find out how much time you spend on social media. If it's more than hours per day, I'm telling you that's the culprit. Delete the app. Delete those things. Clear your mind of that kind of idolatry. Free yourself. You don't have to live life that way. You don't have to live life following after what everyone else does. God has a better plan for you. We don't have to be like these Baal idolaters who are screaming at the top of their lungs, hoping that Baal will listen, hoping that Baal will obey, cutting ourselves in hopes that we'll bleed and get attention. It's crazy to me, right? That we do that to ourselves without even thinking about the damage that it's doing to our actual souls. 
Psalms actually says something about this. Psalm 135, 15 through 18. The idols of the nation are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak. They have eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear. Nor is there any breath in their mouths. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. Idols are worthless. They don't serve you. They don't give you anything back. You give as much as you can possibly give and you come out empty-handed. What did the Baal prophets gain by doing all of this in front of Baal? For nine hours, they were cutting themselves and yelling and screaming. What did they gain? Nothing. Same thing with idols. Look at verse 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. And all the people came near to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two seas of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bull in, in, in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four jars with water and put it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water ran around the altar and filled the trench also with water. So just so nobody thinks that he's cheating, he pours water over everything. But first, he puts 12 stones down. Those 12 stones represent the 12 tribes of Israel. Elijah's reminding the people, hey, God has a relationship with you. You have a relationship with God. He made a promise to the 12 tribes of Israel. And then how much times is the water poured out? Three times four, 12. 12 times jars of water are poured onto this altar. A reminder to the people of Israel, God is still your God. God still wants a relationship with you. <coughs> Verse 36. And at the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. Does Elijah come out and cut himself and do crazy things? Does Elijah come out and dance? Does he do any sort of weird routine? He doesn't do anything. He just comes out and prays. And Jesus actually commends this. Jesus says this, right? Before he teaches his disciples the Lord's Prayer, he says, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask them. In other words, prayer is powerful. Elijah's prayer is powerful. And what does Elijah specifically pray? He doesn't pray, God, let me get your attention. God, come and hear me. God, listen to me. God, listen to me. God, listen to me. You know what he prays? He says, God, hear this prayer, and I want you to show the people that you have already turned their hearts back. The Baal prophets were praying, God, look at us, look at us, look at us, look at us. And what Elijah prays is the exact opposite. God, show yourself to be the God who already sees us. And then look at verse 37. Sorry, verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell, consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Very simple. Fire comes down, licks up everything. And then what happens? The people bow down and they worship the Lord and then it says in verse 40, And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slaughtered them there. Now why are they slaughtered? Because the word of the Lord specifically stated that if there's a prophet who leads the people astray, the punishment for their sin is going to be this kind of judgment. It's going to be death by the sword. And you can say, oh man, Elijah was so good until this point and then he just brings and he just murders them. But this is not murder. This is God's judgment. Every single idolater who's living on earth now will actually experience this kind of slaughter and this kind of death because the Bible is real about what happens after this life. You guys know this life is not that, it's not it. After you die, you go somewhere and it's based off of who you worship. It's based off of who you spend your time prioritizing in your life. And again, if we're honest, not a single one of us live every single day pointing our lives to God. Most of us live every single day pointing our life towards something else, even those who claim to be Christians. At the end of the day, that's the thing that should matter the most. Verse 40 should shake us up. Verse 40 should awaken us. Verse 40 should make the thing that's on your screen, that's not the Bible. Whatever it is that you're paying attention to, click off your screen and pay attention for half a second because at one point you're going to die. Where do you go when you die? If you're an atheist, well, then you just, that's it. But what if atheism isn't true? How do you know that there is no God? 
How can you explain the entire universe coming out of nothing? The atheists don't have a good explanation for this. Atheists can't even tell you why we have males and females, right? Because if evolution is true and everything started as an amoeba, an amoeba is an asexual thing. Meaning amoebas don't need male. There's no male. There's no boy amoeba and girl amoeba. There's no Bob amoeba and I can't think of a girl name. All of a sudden. <laughs> and Jill amoeba. Okay, and then they meet together and have a family, and then there's children amoebas. Amoebas just split themselves and they just create male and female. So how did we end up with male and female? Right? Because if one amoeba splits and it mutates itself into a boy amoeba, it, there's no other girl amoebas. So guess what? Boy amoeba dies a lonely existence. And the other amoebas continue to just split themselves. In order for there to be male and female, you have to have a boy amoeba and all the boy parts and a girl amoeba and all the girl parts. And those two have to fall in love and make a family. What are the chances that that would happen in one single generation? It's zero. It's zero. The chances are greater that you'll be hit by lightning 10 times as you walk out of this building. Guys, atheism can't be true based off of science. Something's going to happen to us when we die, every single one of us. The question is, where do you go? Did you live your life serving God? Did you live your life searching after the true and living God and give your life to him and make sure that your relationship is right with him? Or have you been living life pretending as if he doesn't exist, serving your own soul, serving your own heart? Now, there's something weird between verse 40 and verse 41. And I want you to pay attention to this because this is everything. Pay attention to what happens between verse 40 and verse 41. And Elijah said to them, verse 40, seize the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slaughtered them there. Verse 41, and Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there's the sound of the rushing of rain. What? Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Ahab is the worst king Israel's ever had. And I told you guys last week, I called it the Ahab problem. The prophets of Baal were killed for their idolatry. Makes sense. Why is Ahab being invited to go up and have a meal? What is happening here? What is going on? Because if anyone should die, shouldn't it be Ahab? Isn't Ahab the one that married Jezebel that caused all these Baal prophets to come in? Isn't Ahab the one who couldn't care less about what happened to the people of Israel, cared more about his horses and his mules? Isn't Ahab the worst? Shouldn't Ahab be killed for his idolatry? Why is Ahab invited to go up, eat and drink, for there's the sound of rushing rain? Because God is merciful. Why are any of us in here able to breathe air and breathe out air when all we've done for the last seven days is think idolatrous thoughts and, and do rebellious things against the Lord and sin in ways in our minds and in our actions that are absolutely an affront to the holy God of the universe. How is it possible that every single one of us is breathing in air and breathing out air? How is it possible that God hasn't just judged every single one of us and we're all dead and we're all in eternal torment in the lake of fire, in the second death, in hell? How is it possible that that's not the reality for us living right now, given the things we think about and given the things that we do every single day? God's mercy. God's absolute, radical, crazy, life-transforming, life-giving mercy. Ahab is not killed in the midst of the Baal prophets because God is merciful, not because Ahab is good. Don't you get it? You and I, we're Ahab. We're Ahab in this story. You are standing and sitting here in this room, breathing air in and out because God still has mercy available for you. And God still wants a relationship with you. And God wants to show you his goodness. What is Ahab about to experience? He's about to experience God's reign of mercy, literal reign. Rain is going to fall as Elijah prays. And Ahab is going to know that God is inviting him into relationship. That's what's available to us. This is why I worship God. Because God is good even though I'm not. Right? 
And what is it that God is going to do for Ahab? It says in verse 42, So Ahab went to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel, and he bowed himself down on the earth and put his face between his knees. He said to a servant, Go up now and look toward the sea. And he went up and looked, and there's nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. And at the seventh time, he said, Behold, a little cloud like a man's hand is rising from the sea. And he said, Go up and say to Ahab, Prepare your chariot and go down, lest the rain stop you. And in a little while, the heavens grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel and the hand of the Lord was on Elijah and he gathered up his garments and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. God is going to rain down rain. He's going to make the land stop with the famine and he's going to be abundant once again. And why is he doing this? What in the world did Ahab do to deserve God's mercy and grace like this? Nothing. Ahab did nothing and God is so good to him. That's the God that we serve. That's the God that's merciful and gracious. That's the God who forgives you even though, yes, you play with your phones, you're not paying attention. I know, we know, but God's patient and he's waiting for you. And I hope, and I would hope that one day your phone doesn't become more interesting than the God of the universe. And I would pray that your neighbor and wanting to pass notes doesn't become more interesting than the God of the actual universe. And that's why we pray. You know who's praying for you? Your teachers are praying for you. Are your friends praying for you? I don't know. Are your classmates praying for you? I don't know. Are your parents even praying for you? I don't know, but I know our teachers are praying for you. And this is the place where you can receive that kind of prayer. This is the place where you can receive that kind of love and encouragement to continue on and to have actual faith. That's how much we believe in you. That's how much we love you. That's why we're here. This is the place where you can learn and know about this God, the actual God who saves. And I would love for you to pay attention. And I would love for you to focus in. And I would love for you to know who this God actually is. Because this is the place where you can meet him. And I want to end with this. There's a random story in the New Testament where um, Jesus is journeying with his disciples. It's uh, very close to Jesus' death on the cross. It's like a couple, of, uh, a couple of days before Jesus is about to die. And they go to a village. The disciples are sent to a village. So it says, verse 51, when the days drew near for him, that's Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem and he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparation for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. Now, I don't exactly know what that means, like why the Samaritans didn't receive him. But look at the... Look at the reaction to verse 54. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Like, this is a crazy, crazy, it's a weird story, but it's an even crazier reaction. So James and John, who had been following Jesus for three years, they see that the Samaritans are like, "Uh, we don't really want to deal with you guys. And James and John look at Jesus and say, all right, Jesus, they're treating us pretty bad here. Should we send down fire from heaven to come and consume them? Like, I, I don't know what they were thinking, and I don't know what they were picturing, but it's not a stretch to imagine that they were thinking about 1 Kings chapter 18 or that they were thinking about Sodom and Gomorrah which God consumed with fire. In other words, they were thinking about, let's prove to these knuckleheads that this guy comes from God and let's show them who's the boss. Verse 55, but Jesus turned and rebuked them and they went on to another village. Jesus says, no, like that is not what I'm here to do. I am not here to rain down fire on those who reject me. I'm here to die for them on a cross. All of us have rejected Jesus in some way, shape, or form this week. All of us have rejected God in some shape or form this week. And the message of grace that we have available for you from God himself is I forgive you for that and I can prove that I've forgiven you for that because I've sent Jesus to die for you on the cross. And so I'm inviting you into relationship and I'm better than all of this other stuff. I'm better than whatever likes you can get on Instagram. I'm better than whatever video games you can play and pass your time. I'm better than all of the things that you think will fulfill your soul because I am the God who made you and I want and desire a relationship with you. I'm gonna ask you guys to close your eyes. One of the things that Elijah's taught me as a leader is that we have to pray. We have to pray more. I have to pray more. Elijah was able to uh, confront Ahab with the drought because he prayed. And Elijah was able to bring the rain back because he prayed. 
And what I'm seeing is that all of us in this room, we need to receive the reign of God's mercy. And as teachers, man, that's something that we need to pray for. Some of you guys have family members who are not believers. Maybe you're the only Christian in your family and you're here and you're wondering, where can I get encouragement? And I'm telling you, the way Elijah prayed is such an encouragement to us. Because what, what Elijah shows us is that when you pray, God hears. And, and notice Elijah's prayers are simple. And he prays, God, turn their hearts back to you. N let them know that you've already done that work. And so I want to invite you for those of us, for those of you who want to see um, more of God's people express their love for Christ here in this church, I'm going to ask you to, to pray along with us as the leaders pray that there would be a, a outpouring of God's reign of God's mercy on our souls. I also understand that there's those, those of you in this room who you have yet to, to place your trust in Jesus' life. Maybe you've been coming to church all these years, but you've never really thought about what it means to follow Jesus. You've never really been confronted with this idea that, that you've been following other gods, you've been following yourself, but you haven't been following after Jesus himself. And maybe there's, a, there's an inclination in your heart. Maybe there's a, there's, a, there's a bending in your heart towards wanting that and desiring that. And you hear this word and you read through this passage and you're like, you know, I want a little bit of more of Jesus in my life. Then I want to invite you to pray and pray and invite Jesus into your life and ask him to, to help guide you in the direction that you need to go. Let's just spend a few moments praying for those things and then I'll close us. Father, we're tired of serving idols that can't answer us. Father, we're tired of serving gods that we give our time and effort to and they give nothing back to us in return. We're tired of doing things that cause us to feel worse about ourselves at the end. We're tired of wasting our time and wondering where the day went. We're tired of just looking forward to the next thing to just entertain us, driven by a mind that is so debased and so corrupted by what the world considers entertainment. That the things that we look for now on YouTube are videos of people harming other people and us thinking that that's funny, of terrible things happening to other people and us thinking somehow that that's entertaining to us. God, forgive us for that kind of heart. Help us to take a step back and see that that kind of heart is wicked and it's evil and it's not good and we don't want to live that way. We don't want to live as though that kind of heart is somehow acceptable and okay. God, forgive us for that. Help us instead to turn to you because you offer us eternal life. You offer us forgiveness. You offer us grace. You offer us relationship. You open your heart to us to invite us into relationship where we can receive your great mercy and your great love and we can be fulfilled in ways that we've never been fulfilled before. And we can have joy that we've never had before. And so I pray, Lord, that you would help us to see and feel and understand that. And help us to recognize that that comes from encouragement here in this place. As we seek to know each other more, as we seek to love each other more, as we seek to serve and encourage each other more. Father, I pray for those of us who are leaders, um, who want to continue to serve the members of Roots Ministry. I ask, Lord, that you would humble us and help us to continue to pray and to pray hard and to pray, Lord, knowing that you are hearing us and our prayers are not falling to the wayside. But pray, Lord, knowing that there's power in our prayers. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.